we spent the last few videos constructing different number systems. And what I'd like to do in this video is try to put everything together and talk about how the different systems relate to one another. So the number systems that we've constructed so far include the set of natural numbers, omega, the set of integers, z, the set of rational numbers, q, and the set of real numbers, r. And just to very quickly go over the procedure for constructing each one, we had omega first, a set of natural numbers. What we did is we had this axiom of infinity, which is one of the ZFC axioms, which postulated that there's at least one inductive set uh, sitting out there in our set theoretic universe. And then we considered some subset of that assumed set. And this turned out to be the set of natural numbers. So we got the set of natural numbers from the axiom of, of infinity, basically. Once we had the natural numbers, omega, we constructed the integers, z, by considering some quotient set, omega times omega modulo tilde, where two ordered pairs are considered to be equivalent, in this case, if a plus d was equal to b plus c. And this is basically the method of considering differences, where we said that a, b, the ordered pair a, b, sort of corresponds to a minus b, where all the elements of the ordered pairs here and here are natural numbers. And we had a similar procedure for, constru for constructing the rational numbers once we had the integers. We again considered some quotient set, in this case, z times z prime, where z prime is all the integers excluding zero. And again, we had some equivalence relation tilde. And we said the two order pairs are equivalent, in this case, if a times d was equal to b times c, where all the components of these ordered pairs now are integers. And this equivalence relation was motivated by the usual means for testing whether two ratios are the same. And then once we had the set of rational numbers, we constructed the real numbers, r, by using dedicate cuts. And remember what these were. These are just special subsets of the rational numbers. Now, I'm sure that at some point in high school, everyone was introduced to this idea that you can start with the natural numbers, and then you have the integers here, where the natural numbers are a subset of the integers. And then the integers are contained within the rational numbers. And then somehow the rational numbers are contained within the real numbers. And then, yeah, you might have like the complex numbers here and hyper complex numbers and, and so forth. So this is suggesting that each one is a subset of the next higher upset in the hierarchy. Now, uh, strictly speaking, I think this whole idea is completely ridiculous. And uh, for the following reason, it's suggesting that if indeed the natural numbers are a subset of the integers, then it should be true that the natural number two is equal, not just corresponds with equal to the integer two. Now, if you look at what we just constructed, that would suggest that this set, the second tank, the empty set, and the second tank, the empty set, is the same as this equivalence class here, namely the equivalence class of the order of pair to zero. Now it's pretty clear that, at least I think it's pretty clear that these two sets are not equal in the strict sense of being identical to one another. But there is a sort of an idea here that I guess is what's being taught is that there's an operational correspondence between the natural number two and the integer two in the sense that they behave the same under certain operations like addition, multiplication, and ordering. So they're not identical, strictly speaking, at least if you want to be rigorous about this, they're not identical, but there is a correspondence between the two. And I, this is basically the idea I'd like to explore in this video is the correspondence between these objects. Essentially, what we need to be able to do is to associate a member of one set, for example, the set of natural numbers to some corresponding element in, for example, the set of integers. For example, we'd want to associate the natural number zero to the integer zero and vice versa, the integer zero to the natural number zero and the natural number one to the integer one and so on. And furthermore, as we proceed up the hierarchy, we'd like to associate the integer one to the rational number one and then eventually the rational number one to the real number one and again, vice versa, the real number one to the rational number. So a good way to do this would be to set up an injective function. And if you're wondering why it's got to be injective, 
is because we want to be able to go in this reverse direction uniquely. And in terms of the terminology, such a function, let's call it E, that we're going to set up is called an embedding function. So what we're going to do first is set up these associations between the set of natural numbers and the set of integers. That is, we're going to set up an, an embedding from omega to z. So what we want this embedding function e to do when it associates a whole number to an integer is preserve certain operations, such as addition, multiplication, and ordering. And I'm going to lay out two processes that I claim we want to be equal to one another. So let's consider this first process. I'll call it process one. Let's suppose we take two natural numbers, m and n, convert them to integers or associate them with some integer. Let's call it e of m and e of n. So now these two objects are going to be integers. And then we add these two integers. So we have e of m plus e of n. And then let's consider this second process. Let's say I take these two natural numbers. Instead of converting them to integers right away, let's add them as natural numbers first. So we're going to form m plus n in the, the realm of natural numbers. And then we're going to take that sum, m plus n, and then convert that to an integer, which is going to be e of m plus n. So I claim that one property that we want of this e function is to preserve operations between whole number or natural number addition and integer addition. So symbolically, what we want is if you follow through what these two processes are doing, we want the conversion of the natural number m plus n to be the same as the integer sum of e of m and e of n. So this thing on the left hand side corresponded to process two and the thing on the right hand side corresponded to process one. So this is kind of why you check these sorts of properties, these uh, linearity properties when you take like, like a linear algebra course. You want to make sure that these sorts of transformations have this property. So this is sort of why you, you'd like this. Because if this property holds, we say that it preserves the addition operations. And the corresponding feature that we want of E for multiplication is that E of m times n, where this dot here represents natural number multiplication, is the same as e of m times e of n, where this dot here represents integer multiplication. So again, we want addition and multiplication to be preserved when transforming between these sets. And another property that we'd like to is that when we compare whether two natural numbers are in a certain ordering relation to one another, we want that ordering to be preserved when we move into the integers. Now that we've considered some of the properties that we'd like out of this E function, let's actually write down this E function, which remember is going to take members of the set omega to members of the set Z. Now, just to remind you of what we want, we want one to be mapped to the integer one and the natural number two to be mapped to the integer two. And just to remind, me, or to remind you of what the integer 1 corresponded to, it corresponded to the equivalence class of the order pair 1, 0. And the integer 2 corresponded to the equivalence class of the order pair 2, 0. So how would you write down a function that would map in this sort of fashion? So if you want to guess what the function looks like yourself, I'd recommend pausing the video now and see if we can write it down. So here's what this function looks like. So what it's saying is that you give me some natural number n and the corresponding integer e of n is just going to be the equivalence class of n0. And hopefully that's pretty intuitive if we write down kind of what we want the mapping to do and the symbolic form of the mapping. And it turns out that this e function is going to have all the properties that we want. e is going to be injective and it preserves the operations. That is, it's going to have the property that e of m plus n is equal to e of m plus, in the integer addition, e of n. And the proof of that is pretty simple. So what you do is just you apply a definition. So e of m plus n is equal to the equivalence class of the order pair m plus n, 0. 
and then you just write down the definition for E of M and E of N. So I have the equivalence class of M0 plus, in the integer addition, the equivalence class of N0. And I just use the definition of integer addition, which is adding equivalence classes. And I see that the right-hand side, which is written out here, is indeed equal to the left-hand side. So E preserves addition. And if you want to check for yourself that it preserves multiplication too, I encourage you to do that. And furthermore, E is injective. So what we want to show is that E of M being equal to E of N implies that M is equal to N. Just your usual uh, verification for a function being injective. So let's suppose that E of M is equal to E of N. We apply the definition of E. So that's the left-hand side is going to be equal to the equivalence class of M0. And the right-hand side is going to be equal to the equivalence class of N0. So remember we had that key theorem that we said that when two equivalence classes are equal, we can just pull out any of the representatives and say that those two are equivalent. So the fact that the equivalence class of M0 is, e is equal to the equivalence class of N0 means that M0 is equivalent to N0. And now we're considering uh, order pairs in a land of uh, integers. So how do we say that two ordered pairs are equivalent in this integer sense? Remember what that was? That was just checking whether M plus zero here, this component over here, so that's written over here, M plus zero is equal to zero plus N, which is written on the right-hand side here. And this operation here corresponds to natural number addition. And it indeed follows that M is equal to N. So E is indeed injective. But if this embedding function from omega to Z is set up correctly, and I argue that it is, this allows us, or entitles us to say, that the natural number one corresponds or gets mapped to the integer one and vice versa. The integer one gets mapped through essentially E inverse to the natural number one. And it also allows us to say that two plus three, adding the natural numbers two and three corresponds to adding the integers two and three and vice versa. So this is sort of the, the key set of statements that we want to make through this through setting up this embedding function. So that's how we embed omega into z. So now let's work our way up. Let's embed the integers into the rational numbers. That is, let's embed the set z into the set q. So here's the corresponding set of statements that we want to make. That the integer 1 corresponds to the rational number 1. And just to remind you what the rational number 1 looks like. It's the equivalence class of the order pair 1, 1. Or remember, each of these components is now a, an integer, not a natural number as it was before. And we also want to say that the integer 2 corresponds to the rational number 2, which again is equal to the equivalence class of 2, 1. And you can sort of see the pattern here. And we're going to use this pattern to set up the embedding function, which I'm going to call f which is going to take elements of Z into the set Q. And what we're going to try out is F of N, where N is some integer, gets mapped to the equivalence class of N1. And hopefully you can see why that is if you continue out this pattern here, why we want to map N to the equivalence class of N1. And as we did before, we want to make sure that this F function is injective and it preserves operations. And also it preserves order and it preserves uh, additive and multiplicative identities and inverses. That is that the integer zero gets taken to the rational number zero. And also that the integer one gets taken to the rational number one. And I encourage you to verify all those properties yourself. And what I'll do here just to verify that this F contains at least some of these properties is that F is injective. So again, let's consider F of M is equal to F of N. And I want to show that M is equal to N. Again, I just apply the definition of F. So I have that F of M is equal to the equivalence class of M1, which is equal to the equivalence class of N1. And remember, if two equivalent classes are equal, I can pull out some representative of each one and say that those are equivalent. And now 
for the rational numbers, what was our criterion for saying that two ordered pairs are equivalent? It was checking whether two ratios are equivalent. So we wanted m times 1 to be equal to 1 times n. And that's what I have written down here. And you can see just through integer arithmetic, where this multiplication symbol means integer multiplication, that indeed m is equal to n. So that shows that this f embedding function is injective. Now the last function I'll set up is the embedding function from the rational numbers into the real numbers. So I'm now going to set up some function which is going to map q into r. And again, the sorts of statements that we want to make include saying that the rational number 1 half is associated to the real number 1 half, and that the rational number 1 is associated to the real number 1. And just to remind you of what these objects are, like a real number 1 is, it's just a data cut, where in this case 1, the, the, the real number 1, is going to be the set of all rational numbers less than the rational number 1. So the way to set up this embedding function, I'm going to call it g, taking q into r, is going to be as follows. So g of n, where n is some rational number, is going to be the Dedekind cut, where it's going to be all the rational numbers less than that n that you give me. So this is just you input some rational number, and the output is some Dedekind cut. And it turns out that this function g works, and it has all the desired properties. And again, I'll just prove that it's injective. And the way I'm going to do that is normally what we do is say that g of m being equal to g of n implies that m is equal to n. That's the usual method of proof. Instead, what I'm going to do is prove the contrapositive, that m not being equal to n implies that g of m is not equal to g of n. So I'm going to suppose that two rational numbers, m and n, are not equal. Now, I know that uh, the trichotomy property holds for rational numbers, so that m not being equal to n implies that either m is less than n or n is less than m. And hopefully you can see just by examining the definition for g, the truth of th this statement, m is less than n or n is less than m, implies that either g of m is a proper subset of g of n or g of n is a proper subset of g of m. And now trichotomy also holds for real numbers or Dedekind cuts. So if either of these is true, this implies that g of m can't be equal to g of n. So that proves that g is injective. And as before, I encourage you to check the other properties as well. To summarize what we've set up, we first embedded the set omega into z through the function e. We embedded the set z into q through the function f. And then finally, we embedded q into r with the function g. Now you can see that what we're doing here is we're traveling one step at a time up the hierarchy. Now, instead of moving one step at a time, we could sort of skip levels too if we wanted to. That is, we can move from omega directly into r, or from z directly into r, or from omega into q. And the way to do this would just be through function composition. That is, we can set up appropriate embedding functions for these other three possibilities just through composing these functions that we've set up. For example, if you wanted to move from omega to r, you just do function composition of g of f of v. E. From z to r, you just do g of f. And then if you want to move from omega to q, you just compose f and e. And I encourage you to check for yourself that if each of these functions has all those desired properties individually, that is, uh, they preserve operation, order, they're injective, then that implies that these function compositions uh, preserve those operations and are injective themselves. And that wraps up this video. As always, thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to my channel, like the video, and stay tuned for more topics in set theory.